Hi, I'm Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. And today we're talking remotely once again with Dr. Brett Fink. Dr. Fink is an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon who practices at Community Health Network in Indianapolis, Indiana. Dr. Fink did his medical school training at, the Uni at Washington University in St. Louis. And from there, an orthopedic residency at the Portsmouth Naval Hospital in Portsmouth, Virginia. And from there, two orthopedic foot and ankle fellowships, one at Boston University and the other at University of Miami. Thanks for joining us again today, Dr. Fink. Thank you, Randall. Dr. Fink, today I thought we would talk a bit about bunions. And I think uh, most people are familiar with the term bunions, uh, which is a condition of the foot that we sometimes, as orthopedic surgeons, call hallux valgus. But if you would, start out by describing exactly what a bunion is and how a bunion forms. You're right. A bunion is, uh, it's, when you see it, you know what it is. But a bunion is a very complex deformity. And... Uh, um, most people no notice a bunion because it is a prominence on the inside of the foot, a prominence right about where the, at the base of the toe. Um, it forms because the joints of the big toe become unstable. One of the bones, the metatarsal bone, which is on the end of the front of the foot and ends at about the ball of the foot, starts to tilt towards the inside of the foot, out towards the, uh, um, the border of the foot. The other toe starts to tilt towards the other toes. Um, the big toe tilts towards the second toe uh, so that the joint becomes very prominent. And that can become a problem when someone is trying to wear shoes uh, because the uh, bump on the inside of the foot hits the shoe and becomes very uncomfortable. Well, let's talk a little bit about why patients come to see you as a foot surgeon when they have a bunion. Is this because of pain or because of the deformity? What brings folks into your office? There are a lot of reasons that people can come in. The most common is because it hurts, because they just can't find shoes that fit properly. Um, however, uh, many times people come in because they're worried about what might happen in the future to them as far as the bunion's concerned. They're worried that if they don't have surgery right away that the deformity could be a bigger problem. Uh, or they're concerned that they might not be doing something right. I often get parents that come in because they're worried about their ch children's feet and whether they're going to develop properly or become a problem in the future. Well, and you mentioned children coming in with bunions. What sort of uh, groups of people do we see most likely uh, that present with bunions? Is this something that we see in children? Is it something that we see in adults, men, women? What sort of things do you find uh, are common to folks that uh, end up with bunions? Well, basically there are two types of bunions. There's the adolescent bunion, which is, which is the bunion that has formed in a foot that's never, where the toe has never really been straight. This is a bunion that is pr primarily caused by genetics. People are just, their, their genes have programmed their foot to develop a bunion. And many times these people will have mothers or grandmothers that also have had bunions all their life. Um, and this is quite a different deformity than the developmental bunion or adult bunion which usually forms over the course of a lifetime and might come in with a history of the toe beginning fairly straight in young adulthood, but as they go into middle age, the toe become, becomes more and more out of alignment. And that's more of a de developmental problem. And when you say developmental, I mean, is this something that occurs over years? Is it something that can occur fairly rapidly once it starts? Well, usually it does occur over years, but sometimes it can be pretty rapid. As a matter of fact, I, rarely I see people that have had injuries that will develop a traumatic bunion where the ligaments around the joint become unstable uh, as a result of trauma and actually fall out of place and, can occur, and that can occur over a period of hours or even instantaneously. Well, let's try to give the, the viewer some idea of how this deformity occurs. Can you describe the forces that are at work on the foot in the developmental bunion the one that occurs in adulthood, how this progresses over time? Well, that, that's a very good question and a very complicated question. And unfortunately, no one knows really why bunions uh, develop. What we do know is that bunions are much more common in societies where they wear shoes. So the shoes probably have uh, a, a part in the development of the bunion. Um, and it, I, it's unclear to me whether it is because the shoes are too tight 
or because they change the way that the foot develops in such a way that, that it doesn't develop proper strength. And that's something that I think uh, uh, people just haven't uh, figured out yet. Um, but what might happen is that the pressure from the shoes may deform the toes over time such that they um, uh, twist into a funny direction. The ligaments on the outside or the inside border of the foot, the, the border that's towards the other foot, um, may stretch out so that the uh, toe becomes looser. Um, there also may be a situation where the muscles do not develop properly and because of that the forces, the, the joints are allowed to um, stretch out over time. Uh, it's, really, uh, it's really quite unclear and, and a, a, very, a great source of interest to in myself um, and something that I, that I have thought about a great deal. Well, I think we, we, as orthopedic surgeons, we're always fond of telling people to buy the appropriate shoes. Um, I, I think we're less likely to tell people what the appropriate shoe wear is. And there's been some, some discussion in the past over the years about high-heeled shoes, pointy-toed shoes, different types of shoes that may uh, be conducive to the formation of bunion. Do you feel that there are certain types of shoe wear that are more likely to cause a bunion than others? Well, I, I do believe that, uh, that high-heeled and pointy-toed shoes probably do uh, cause some of the uh, bunions that I see. But uh, I've got to tell you, I'm not, people often come in um, kind of berating themselves uh, putting themselves down because they've worn, you know, quote, bad shoes, unquote, all their life. And uh, I've got to say that, that I don't think it's as big a factor as um, many doctors uh, suggest that it is. Uh, certainly, if you cram uh, your toes into a, a pointed toed shoes, a shoe, and uh, and press it in there over time, you'd expect the toe to develop that shape. But a, a large number of my patients have never really worn shoes like that. And uh, I am unsure that it is a big factor in the development of most bunions. Um, now, to, to get to your second question, which is what are the right shoes for, for someone that is starting to develop a bunion? Well, I think that a, uh, I think that a shoe that has a upper, uh, the top portion of the shoe, uh, which is soft and compliant and conforms to the foot, is probably important. Um, it's also important not to wear an exaggerated heel. And I think that uh, some degree of elevation, perhaps half an inch to an inch, is probably okay. But you certainly don't want to uh, have a three-inch heel uh, more or less stuffing your, uh, your toes into a very narrow uh, uh, and abnormal shoe box. Well, we've, we've talked about, I guess, the genetics of the condition. We've talked a little bit about shoe wear. Uh, is there any other conditions that, that bunions are associated with, other types of medical conditions that may predispose a patient to developing a bunion? Oh, there are a large number of them. A as a matter of fact, the, the most common condition associated with bunions is, is being female. Um, Bunions are approximately four times more common in women than they are in, in men. And again, getting back to the shoe wear issue, it, it's always been thought that, oh well, that's because women wear um, fashionable shoes. And, but uh, I also, you know, I've thought about that question a lot. And um, uh, certainly I know that women have more hand deformities than men too. So I would have to say that it probably has a little bit to do with uh, the way that, that women are made, you know, the fact that, that their ligaments have to be uh, a different uh, degree of compliance in order to bear children has probably got a good factor, uh, a good uh, a portion of that. Um, however, there are other medical problems that are associated with bunions too. Uh, probably the, uh, uh, the most common one is uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, because that eats away at the ligaments so that they become unstable. Um, other things that can cause um, uh, bunions are things like a flat foot because uh, when your foot has turned over or canted towards the inside, it probably pushes on the, the toe so that it becomes more, that, it, that the ligaments on the inside of the toe are stretched out more. 
What about the symptoms? You know, we've mentioned that the symptoms include one is the deformity, but the other is pain. What actually hurts when you have a bunion? Well, classically, the, the reason that people have uh, pain is because the shoe is, or the, t the, the inside border of the toe is just pushing against the shoe too long. Um, if I apply pressure to any part of your body for a long period of time, it will become painful after a while. Um, however, there are probably other things that can cause pain as a result of a bunion. One of them is the fact that as the toe changes uh, over time, over a period of years, uh, the tendons and the other bones around it, um, they don't interact in quite the same way and you can start to develop arthritis. Uh, arthritis in some of the smaller bones on the bottom of the big toe, uh, the sesamoid bones, uh, probably causes some degree of pain. Um, the other thing that happens is that there are nerves that run along the prominence of the bunion and these can become inflamed. Um, or you can develop bursitis, which is a, um, a small sac that develops over places that have a great deal of pressure on them. Uh, and these can swell up suddenly. And you know, I think for people that are watching, I, my understanding is that that's really what the bunion is, or what we refer to as the bunion. You know, you and I probably refer to this condition more as hallux valgus, which is really describing the, the deformity that we see that includes all of the foot, uh, all of the big toe anyway. But I think that, that people tend to, to talk about the bunion as being that prominence and that, that bursitis that really causes the pain from the rubbing on the shoe wear and they see that as the primary problem. Is that your understanding as well? I agree completely. Um, in terms of, of how you begin to evaluate a patient that presents with this, form, this, this deformity that's beginning to occur, how do you start that process in your office? Well, first of all, I, I start out with a history and I try to get an idea of what the, um, the patient's own feelings about the bunions are. As I said before, a, a number of patients have come in, come in with various preconceptions, uh, which may have to be discussed. Um, probably one of the most important is that there's some critical element that they need to get their bunion taken care of quickly or else something bad is going to happen. And, and I try to reassure them that uh, really the bunion should be approached and taken care of only the, to, to the degree that it causes them pain. If the bunion is essentially asymptomatic right now, then it's not time to do anything aggressive about it as far as surgery is concerned. Um, so getting that feel from my patients, I think is probably the most critical thing. The second thing I try to figure out is when the, when the bunion is bother them, bothering them. Uh, a number of times I have found that people have bunions um, but their pain may be caused from a different problem within their foot. Uh, a hammer toe, uh, some arthritis in the middle part of the foot, uh, but the bunion being the most obvious thing in their foot uh, is often the thing that they, they, that they attribute their pain. Uh, and if I had corrected that bunion without looking into the other problems that might be going on in their foot, uh, I might not uh, really help them with their discomfort. Uh, after we've got, kind of gotten an idea of where and when and how the, the, uh, the bunion bothers them, then I examine their foot and we look for other foot deformities that might be present. Um, I look to make sure that the, bun that, the, uh, that the joints have proper and not excessive or restricted motion because um, arthritis is another condition that might be confused for bunions because it can also develop prominences around the big toe. Um, and then I look for their flexibility and make sure that all those things are going to be, that are, although that all those things are normal, because again, those might interfere with the recovery if we were to consider surgery. Uh, and then I talk to them about um, what proper shoe wear is and how they might, uh, and, and the things that they might do that are non-operative that might help them with their pain. And what about radiographs? Any type of x-ray that you normally get on the first visit? I don't always get x-rays. Um, if there is a diagnostic question, um, I think that x-rays are very helpful. Um, 
but there are a number of times where I don't get x-rays because I don't feel that they really add that much to the evaluation of the bunion. Um, much of what you, uh, what you might find from an x-ray is fairly obvious from just looking at the bunion itself and getting a history from the patient. If there is some question as to uh, why they might be hurting or if we are considering surgery, then I think that x-rays are ne necessary. Uh, other radiographic tests such as MRIs or bone scans are almost never necessary. And what about any special lab test or anything like that? Do you routinely get a set of lab tests uh, when you're evaluating patients with bunions uh, to see if they have any of those other associated disease processes? Uh, almost never routinely. Um, usually patients with rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes or, or, or one of the other inflammatory processes that might cause bunions are pretty, there, there's, there's usually other things that are going on. Um, getting just routine screening labs to look for those, uh, I think is really very helpful. So after you've completed your diagnosis and, you're, and you feel relatively certain that you understand what's going on with the patient's foot and that we do in fact have a bunion or hallux valgus condition, how do you begin to have a discussion about treatment? I think you've mentioned already that in some cases, no treatment's necessary. But if you feel that this patient is going to need some treatment, where do you start? Well, after we've established that the bunion is really the thing that is causing them, uh, again, we start from the context of what the patient is, uh, of what my patient is, um, is feeling. If they feel that, um, that if they're there for just informational purposes, I, I give them information about what bunions are and what they can expect in the future. If, it is, if there is really pain or other problems that are, um, are being experienced along with the bunions, uh, then we talk a lot about proper shoe wear and I get, uh, I get an idea from my patients how, what their shoe wear habits have been in the past. So that if, uh, if, they are, um, if they are accustomed to wearing tight pointed shoes or for some reason they're business people and need to wear professional shoe wear at all times, we talk about uh, alternatives that might that we might uh, think about uh, in order to make them more comfortable. Um, one is to pick a shoe that doesn't have seams that run over the bon bony prominences in the bunions. Uh, another may be to um, use a shoe that uses a more compliant upper so that uh, uh, that the uh, prominence along the big toe is uh, is better tolerated. Uh, one of the most uh, critical things that I found is that uh, if the patient is able to predict what shoes they want to wear the following morning, they can use a shoe stretcher to increase the volume of the shoe. They make a variety of shoe stretchers that um, uh, can more or less replicate the anatomy of the individual. They have little buttons that, uh, that you can put over the bony prominences in, in certain areas so that the shoe stretcher actually Bring, or actually brings the shoe out to nor, uh, nor enough volume so that the person can wear the shoe without uh, discomfort, so that they aren't actually using their, their foot to stretch out the shoe every morning. Uh, and I found that to be very helpful. Uh, a lot of times I find that there are strengthening exercises that I put my patients on. If it looks like their foot is particularly uh, in poor condition, uh, I feel that strengthening exercises can be helpful. Um, stretching exercises if they have a type hamstring or Achilles tendon can also be helpful. Um, and I'd say that those are probably the initial non-operative things that we talk about. And what about medications or any type of special injections or anything? Any role of, of those two things in this disease process? I think there's a very limited role of, for injections or any medications. If someone is having a mild degree of pain, they might try an anti-inflammatory like Motrin or Aleve. But if it's any pain that's significant, we've got to look towards um, making the shoes as comfortable as possible. You know, in a lot of uh, conditions, we order orthotics or special shoe wear for our patients to, to use. What about bunions? Are, are orthotics a part of the treatment plan in bunions? I think that, bunion, that orthotics have an occasional use in, um, in bunions. If, like I said, People with flat feet tend to get bunions more commonly than people that uh, have a normal or high arch. 
And um, in those people, I think that orthotics can be helpful. Uh, like I said before, a bunion is a complex deformity that really involves um, a loosening up of the ligaments not only around the ball of the foot, the metatarsal phalangeal joint, but also along the tarsal metatarsal joint. And if someone is having pain along their arch, which is fairly common with bunions, I think that arch supports are helpful in that. Now as far as the choice between a custom and an off-the-shelf arch support, I think that an off-the-shelf arch support is, is, is good enough in 90% of the uh, cases and is much cheaper. There are also pads that you can put over the top of the bunion that can help decrease the amount of friction in between the shoe and the skin. However, you've got to watch out about these pads because they will take up a certain amount of space and most people with bunions are already limited in the amount of extra space they have in their shoes. Well, what about surgical options? You know, we've talked a lot about ways to try to reduce the symptoms and to accommodate the deformity that creates the bunion. When do you finally get to the point to where you feel like that all of those things have failed and perhaps the patient would be better off discussing surgery? What drives you to have that discussion? Well, I think that educating my patients is probably key to helping them decide this. And I, I think it's a choice that both, um, both the patient and I uh, kind of come to and decide whether that's right for them. Um, so one of the most important things is that they have tried uh, to treat the bunion in some way that's not operative. Um, that there is pain present and they're not just trying to make their feet look pretty. Um, and that is something that I occasionally get from patients. I think that overall that bunionectomy, bunion surgery, is too risky and too painful to do for cosmetic purposes. Uh, I usually recommend it only for people that are really having difficulty finding reasonable shoes that fit. Um, and that, is, that should be taken in the context of what the patient feels like they have to wear. There are some professions where you have to uh, look rather professional or people feel more comfortable uh, looking more professional. And in those situations, I think that uh, you have to take that into consideration. Um, certainly, uh, for some of my patients that are salesmen or uh, lawyers or business people of some type, uh, especially the women feel like they um, need to wear some type of pump uh, and if they are uh, uncomfortable and even a fairly reasonable pump uh, I think that that might be a reason for surgery uh, but they should have tried to find another way of treating it and it failed before I think it's a good idea to do surgery and then they have to understand what's involved in surgery before they and decide that that's better than um, than living with their problem. Uh, and I think that those are the important aspects that I need to stress when I'm discussing this with my patients. What about the patient who's concerned about progression? I mean, we know that this is a slowly progressive sort of deformity. Is there any benefit to operating on this before the deformity gets so bad that it's more difficult? Is, is it reasonable to assume that the operation would be simpler earlier rather than later? Well, I, I think a situation like that, like that might, might happen occasionally, but it's so difficult to predict that. Um, when, a, when someone comes into my office and, uh, and they have a, a, a bunion that uh, looks fairly mild to moderate, it's hard to say whether that person is ever going to have a severe bunion. Um, from, from personal experience, I know I've had a bunion really uh, all my life, and uh, I, I can't say that I've noticed that it's changed at all in the, in the 40 years that I've, uh, uh, that I've noticed it. And so from that perspective, it's hard for me to, to take an individual patient and predict what's going to happen 10 years down the road. I find that it rarely is um, that much of a benefit to do the uh, Bunyan procedure before they're having considerable symptoms. And uh, you know, if you've ever been through a bunion procedure, they are painful procedures and most of them, most of the people that are doing it as a, a prophylactic measure um, might 
not see the wisdom of doing it once they're in the middle of uh, recovering from that surgery. They may have so much pain that they're wondering why they ever made that decision. And I try to, uh, I try to make sure that my patients understand that. Well, let's talk about the surgical options. Uh, I know there have been many different types of procedures that have been described in order to treat a bunion. Can you give us an overview of, of what those procedures try to do when we treat a bunion surgically? Sure. There, most bunion procedures attempt to stabilize the uh, foot in some way and to realign it uh, so that the major tendons, the tendons that flex and extend the foot, pass over the center points of the joints in the foot. That way there's nothing really deforming the foot. The forces around the toes are balanced so that you can expect it to stay in proper position. This usually involves tightening the ligaments on the inside of the big toe, loosening the ligaments on the outside of the big toe, and, and typically cutting the metatarsal bone to shift it over. Now there are other procedures that you can do that are different than this. You can, you can fuse the big toe, uh, which is essentially stabilizing the toe, but stabilizing it in such a way that it really doesn't move anymore. Um, there are two basic classes of surgery. One cuts the bone close to the ball of the foot, the other more towards the arch. Uh, the ones that are farther in the arch are usually used for the bigger bunion procedures. But again, most bunion procedures, and there are over 150 of them, um, involve cutting the, a metatarsal bone, tightening ligaments on one side of the toe and loosening ligaments on the other side of the toe to rebalance the foot. Well, and I think, you know, you and I have also seen the situation where the bunion begins to affect the second toe. And sometimes, uh, I think when they're fairly advanced, you actually end up having to do some type of surgical procedure for that second toe that tends to be cocked up uh, because of the, the space that's being taken up for the, for the, from the big toe. Um, we probably ought to let folks know about that because this can turn into a, a, a very extensive operation depending on how serious and how advanced the bunion is. Right. Uh, and just kind of commenting on that, uh, the issue really is that people that have one unstable joint in their foot often have more than one. Um, when the big toe becomes unstable, it stops um, taking care of the weight that it should be assigned during, uh, during gait. So that when you're walking, some of the weight that should be on the big toe is shifted onto the second toe. And this sometimes wears the second toe out such that it becomes a, a hammer toe. It can also wear the, wear the second toe out so that it develops arthritis in the middle part of the foot. One, a, a person with an unstable uh, joint in the big toe is likely to have other unstable joints in their foot. And sometimes um, straightening out the entire foot involves approaching every one of the toes. Uh, and doing other procedures in the back of the foot to rebalance it. Um, so yeah, uh, there can be, it is the exception uh, that the big toe is the only problem in the foot uh, in people with bunions. Well, I think the take home message as you've pointed out when you have that discussion with your patients is that a bunion is not simple. And this usually involves lots of surgery on the foot that takes a long time to recover from. So we probably ought to talk a little bit about that recovery. Once you're done with surgery, what's the patient going to face at that point in terms of that day and then the weeks following that? And then long term, let's talk a little bit about how long does it take for that person to get over this procedure completely and pretty much put it behind them? That, that's exactly right. I, I don't think that any of our listeners should... Uh, um, uh, should make the mistake in, or have anyone convince them that bunion surgery is, any, is ever anything but uh, uncomfortable, at least uh, early on. Uh, most bunion surgeries are same-day procedures, meaning that you come into the hospital to, and leave the same day. Um, but bunion surgeries uh, generally require um, narcotic pain medication. Uh, sometimes uh, especially if there are going to be multiple procedures done on the foot, I'll advise and discuss with the patient the possibility 
of having the anesthesiologist do a pain block, a, uh, a separate procedure where they put a catheter near one of their um, nerves in order to help them with some of the discomfort uh, in the post-operative period. And this can last anywhere from one to three days and help cut down on the need for narcotic pain medication. Because the bones are cut, uh, and even though they're usually fixed with either a plastic or a metallic implant, um, they cannot be walked on for usually between four and eight weeks. It really depends upon uh, the individual procedure. Um, and I usually, my routine uh, for my patients is to uh, dress their wound on a weekly basis for the first three weeks. Um, in a dressing which they can't remove. One of the things that I think uh, patients need to understand most is the degree of swelling that can occur for a long time after this procedure. It is not at all unusual um, to have some degree of swelling for four to six months after the procedure, perhaps even swelling uh, great enough so that it may be difficult to wear some forms of uh, fairly snug shoes. And how long does it take before you really are behind, this, this operation is behind you and you can pretty much walk in regular shoes, go about your business and, and really have minimal discomfort? Well, that can, ha that can occur anywhere from uh, two to perhaps even greater than six months. Uh, and it's usually, it's usually at least three or four months before people are getting back to normal pretty much. Let's talk a little bit about what could go wrong, complications. What do you worry about when you're performing bunion surgery, um, either right at the time of the surgery or after surgery over a period of time? What are the complications? Well, the number one thing is over or under correcting the bunion. Um, if the bunion recurs, of course, my patients are not going to be very happy about that. But if it's overcorrected, that can be almost as much trouble. Imagine a toe that actually points uh, towards the inside of the foot. This is a condition called hallux varus. Um, the, the, the tip of the toe will press against the inside border of the shoe and make shoe wear perhaps even more difficult than it was before the operation. Uh, wound healing problems, numbness because there are nerves that run on the top and the bottom of the incisions that occur uh, around the inside of the foot. Um, and sometimes if, if, the, if a nerve is damaged, it can become quite sensitive and make shoe wear uh, difficult. Um, other complications, if you cut a bone, the bone may not uh, heal back together. And this is especially common in people with, uh, uh, that are smokers or are, have diabetes. And what about long-term complications? Do you worry about anything way down the road after these procedures? Well, um, in, Again, probably recurrence is the, is the thing down the road that I worry about the most. But once the, joint has, once the joint has developed the bunion and then been realigned, a lot of times it wears out a little bit quicker than it should. And um, people do develop arthritis. Um, as a matter of fact, when I see a patient that is 20, 30 years down the road from a bunionectomy, they may have uh, some significant arthritis. Of course, there are other patients that that don't seem to, to develop that. Well, this has been an excellent discussion. I think that, that it's useful information for all patients that are faced with this fairly common problem. As we close this discussion, is there anything else that you feel like that patients should know uh, that we haven't talked about today? I, I think that the most important thing to, um, uh, to come out of this with is the fact that a bunion uh, is not uh, a horrible disease or a severe diagnosis. If it's uncomfortable, it can tr should be treated aggressively with an, in a non-operative fashion. And if necessary, surgery can be considered for this. But surgery is rarely an emergency and is rarely necessary um, if the bunion is asymptomatic. Um, again, kind of recapping what we said before, uh, you shouldn't worry. In my opinion, you really should not worry about what might happen in the future. Those problems can be dealt with uh, down the road if they become problems. And you might be surprised that things uh, about your bunion that you thought might, might bother you in 10 or 20 years may not be such a big deal when uh, 10 or 20 years has passed. 
there may be other problems that uh, are more important to you. And so I think that you should take that into consideration when you decide what to do about your bunion. Well, I think all of this is great advice, and I, th I want to thank you for sharing this information with, with patients today. So look forward to further discussions in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Randall.